So in any x-ray room, in any standard x-ray room, you're going to have these, these things here. And one of them, more than the others, we'll be spending a lot of time on in the digital module. But we've got a control booth. Um, what is a control booth and maybe what's its purpose? Let's, let's try to see if we can answer that. If you've been with me for a while, you've been in a control booth. So why do we have one? Ooh, that's the control console. Um, we'll get there. That's the next bullet point down. What's the control booth? It's what's Right, it's 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 the where you take the X-ray, where the operator, you, the X-ray tech, takes the X-ray from, right? So, are you in the room next to the patient when you take the X-rays? No. Can you be? No. Right. Your equipment can't um, is actually not by law. By law, your equipment is not allowed to allow you into the X-ray room during an exposure. You could have, a, you know, I mean, we've got wireless TV remotes, right? You could have a wireless exposure remote, okay? It wouldn't be that hard for an engineer to make one of those. It's just not legal, okay? You can't be in, there's no reason for, for it to be a wireless thing for you to be able to walk into the x-ray room during an exposure. Why? Why should you be behind a control booth? Because it'll be scattered. Radiation. There's scattered radiation, right? And we've learned uh, through several things that we've said that uh, x-rays can be harmful to the body, right? Now, if you get one, you know, the patient's getting an x-ray, so why don't we put them behind a control booth, right? Well, they need the x-ray. They need the imaging done. They have to be exposed to radiation, right, to get the imaging. On the other hand, we're in the x-ray room every day, right, taking images on lots of different people, right? And if we're exposing ourselves to the x-ray beam or scattered radiation from the patient on a regular basis, that's going to increase our chances for bad things, diseases and stuff like that as we, as we grow older, right? So we have a control booth, and that control booth serves as a barrier for you, okay? That keeps you separated from the, uh, the, the x-ray beam and, as, and the patient, which is the thing in the x-ray room that scatters radiation. Good. Control console. Control console is the thing that you make settings at, right? We've been talking about controlling the quantity, the amount of x-rays we produce in an x-ray beam. Think of that as the brightness of your flashlights, right? And we've been talking about other settings like changing the power, the energy, the penetration of the x-ray beam, right? Think about that as changing the color of your flashlight, okay? Um, and I remember I always analogize flashlights and x-ray machines because it's a very similar thing they're producing, just different in energy. They both produce a type of light. X-ray is just a type of light you can't see. The control console is where we make all those settings and it's where we make the exposures at. Um, this over here, which is drawn all over by a previous instructor, is an example of a control console. Okay, this is an old one. It's kind of like the one we have in our x-ray room, though it's not too far off from it. But I bet you it's a lot, uh, a lot of the ways off from the kind that you see in your clinical settings, right, which are much, much newer chemically, right? It's good for those to be newer. Um, they have to be quick and efficient in the clinical setting, right? You've got to be able to set technical settings very fast. Um, and where these older machines take a little longer. You have to set each thing separately. So you'll have settings for the amount of x-rays produced, the energy of the x-ray beam. These are changing those settings. That's your control console. The transformer. The transformer is, um, so we think about it like this. We plug into the wall. We get power from the wall, right? Um, the power from the wall is enough power to power um, TVs and computers and blenders and microwaves and stuff like that, right? But it's not enough power to create the energy needed to make an x-ray beam, okay? We have to run the electricity we get through the wall through something called a transformer. And as the word transformer implies, it transforms the electricity into a different kind, an electricity with more energy, okay? More, specific, more energy in a very specific way. That's a transformer cabinet. We have one in our x-ray room, so when you go in there, you'll definitely see that. The x-ray tube is the name given to the, the, the part of the equipment that actually produces the x-ray beam. X-ray tube sits above the table. It can point at the wall or the table, and it produces the beam. It's the thing that the x-ray techs are, are constantly moving around, positioning over the body part, right? It has a box on the bottom called a collimator box. That box produces a, a square light field. You can change the size of that light field. You can center that um, light field to the body part. And we have now a representation of where the x-ray beam will be. And the x-ray tube is the thing that produces the x-ray beam. Again, going to my equipment over here, this thing up here is an example of an x-ray tube. Okay, this sits above the tabletop, produces the x-ray beam. Good. We take, spend a lot of time, if you've been with me for a while, you know we spend a lot of time learning about the x-ray tube in the, the uh, section called equipment operation. 
All right, then down to the uh, cassette holders, and I, I will go now to the uh, next slide for that. So real quickly, there is an example up top of the X-ray tube, okay? Tubes up here, this box is just a box, right? We've learned that that box has lead strips in it that change their uh, dimensions and make, make, give, us a, give us a light field. There's also a light bulb in this box, control knobs, and you'll see various other controls on the X-ray tube. This is your upright cassette holder. You notice the one on the left looks a lot like the one we have over there by Mr. Skeleton, okay? And the one on the right here, a little bit different, but their purpose, uh, do I have a cassette in here? Yeah, I got a cassette. Um, but again, their purpose is to hold the cassette, okay? Whether it's a CR cassette like this, or a DR cassette like what we just got, or a film cassette, the purpose of the upright cassette holder is to hold the imaging plate. This thing is the cassette, or the imaging plate, or the IR, whatever you want to call it, okay? This is the thing that catches the image. It's like a detector in a camera, right? Okay, so upright cassette holder. Alex? Yes, sir. It says that, um, I don't know where we saw it in our book, but it says like after they shoot an image, there's still 75% of the radiation on mm -hmm. that cassette, mm -hmm. and then, we're, then we get the cassette and we move it to the bucky, to the thing, so how long? You're not supposed to wait. Oh, you're not supposed to wait a long time, but um, I've done this. So the book will say something like hours, like three hours or so. It'll retain most of the energy that it caught, most of the image that it caught. Um, and this is specific to CR, computed radiography, which is sort of the middle of the road type of imaging. We'll talk about it today. But, um, so it, but yeah, so the x-ray beam hits the cassette, right? It logs the latent image, the information about the patient on here, inside this imaging plate, inside here. Um, and it'll hold on to that for several hours. Now I've done this where um, I've reprocessed plates after 24 hours and the image is still there. So, um, but it, it, it becomes fainter and fainter and fainter the longer you wait before processing it. So typically what we do with these type of cassettes that require a, to be brought to a processor is we take the image and then immediately bring it to the processor, plug it in and we're off and running, okay? Um, and we get an image up on screen in 60 to 90 seconds. But we, should, we usually do it pretty quickly because we know the image stored on here doesn't last for forever. Several hours is what I, would, what I would probably recommend you think about. So yeah, if you take an image and forget to process it till the end of the day, you're probably going to be okay. Okay, But um, that might change with different manufacturers and different uh, materials that the imaging plate inside of here is made out of. Well, I mean, is it safe because of the radiation? To be oh, there's no harmful radiation yeah, in, oh, okay. stored in here. Um, what you learn about x-rays are is that once the beam has been, once the beam turns off, all the harmful part goes away. Yeah, there's no, there's nothing in here that can come out and hurt you anymore, anybody. Yeah. It, all, the only thing that comes out of here is visible light um, or infrared light, the light you can't see or light you can see, but all, all done inside of a processor. So no harm, no harm to, the, to you by leaving that sitting around. It's not like having like a rock of, of you know, a lump of uranium next to you. Yeah. Um, good, good, good. That's a good, that's a really good question though, because uh, it, it is something that in my head seems obvious but doesn't seem obvious to everyone else because uh, radiation means different things to you depending on where you're at in your education right radiation can mean completely different things depending on how much time you spent with me okay so these are our modern upright cassette holders um what are these three little rectangles there's a lot of rectangles on here what are these three smaller rectangles representing what are those those of you who set through principles of exposure with me They're not for CR. Those little um, well, the middle one, no. for chest X-ray, you mean? Well, not just the middle. I don't know. No. So, the, so what I'm pointing at, sorry if it wasn't clear with the laser pointer, are these small little rectangles? Oh, right. These three here that are kind of staggered, right? Mm -hmm. So there are larger rectangles here, right? This one that runs kind of sideways, and then this one that runs kind of vertical, right? Um, those larger rectangles are representing the size of the imaging plate. Like, so yeah, it's either you can put your imaging plate in sideways or vertical, right? Even with this small plate, you can see that it has a length, right, or a height, right? Or, or it could be to put portrait or landscape. We usually say lengthwise or crosswise, right? Um, and the bigger plates, the bigger 14-inch by 17-inch plates, to be clear, this is a 10-inch by 12-inch. A 14 by 17-inch plate, which is the biggest size we typically use, needs to be placed either vertical or horizontal in the, in the, in the, in the wall, the cassette holder. By, by the way, what do we call this thing? Not a cassette holder, we call it a... Bucky. A button. Okay, good. So it's a wall bucky, right? 
um, cassette holder or wall bucky. But anyways, these larger rectangles show you the orientation of the cassette, where it would be in either orientation. That way, because you can't see the cassette, it's inside of here. You put it, there's a tray that pulls out of here, and the cassette has sit inside of here behind this face. So you can't see the cassette, so you want to know, like, where is it at inside of there. That's very helpful to have these outlines. But these three smaller squares, those three smaller squares are for what are called um, automatic exposure control, okay? Normally, in a standard, uh, standard, um, with standard equipment, you make an exposure by setting things like how much x-ray you produce, right? How long you make it for, and how energetic the x-ray beam is, right? That's manual control. You've controlled everything. You've controlled the exposure time, you've controlled the amount of x-rays produced, and the energy of the x-ray beam. But with automatic exposure control, AEC, you're not controlling that, okay? You are making an exposure. Think of the patient being here, the x-ray beam back here, right? The x-ray beam passes through the patient and then hits the uh, image receptor, right? Well, between the image receptor and the patient, there are three detector cells, okay? These are called ion chambers, and their job is to detect radiation, okay? The ion chambers and the computer software are smart. The ion chambers, when x-rays hit them, they start to generate electri electric current, and the computer knows when a certain amount of electric current is generated, I should shut off the exposure. The computer should shut off the exposure, okay? So it's a way of having the computer control how long the exposures last for, automatic exposure control, okay? Now with these ion chambers, you select one, two, or three of them, depending on the body part you're using. A good example would be, if you're taking an x-ray of the lumbar spine, just the spine on a patient, you only need to activate the center cell, because the spine is on the midline of the body, right? But on a chest x-ray, you might want to activate these cells, okay, or all three, right? Depending on what you're looking at, you activate the cells that will, um, be where that body part is, okay? So anyways, that's an upright cassette holder. Those three little squares represent ion chambers. Um, we've talked about AEC before, so I won't go into it too much, but that is what those are. Um, if you don't have AEC, that's fine. Um, most facilities don't, um, but even if you don't have AEC, you probably have a Bucky that looks like that, okay? Um, because a lot of Bucky's just come with the detector cells in them for when we transfer, when an office comes, um, moves towards AEC, like changes things or, um, just makes it easier for them. Anyways, you'll see that a lot, even if you don't have the automatic exposure control. Control. This is a modern control console. This on screen is the equivalent of that whole cabinet over there, right? Um, and you have all the same settings on this that you have over there, just, you know, in a little bit more of a compact digital format. There's your transformer. It's a picture of a transformer, at least. I'm not showing you any of the inside stuff. What's important to pay attention to, there, there are... Um, there are small lines going into it. In fact, you'll see it plugging in back here to the wall. It gets power from the wall back here. Um, and then you'll see these two big lines coming out of it, okay? Those two big lines are much larger than your standard electrical cables, right? Those are what send the high voltage, the high power to the x-ray tube. So these, are, these lines are connected. They run up along the wall and they're connected directly to the x-ray tube. Okay. Your x-ray tube itself um, can have several different movements. So if we think, if we consider this x-ray tube here, it's able to move left and right. That's along the length of the table. It's able to move toward you this way. We call that moving in and out of detent. So detent is that term there. Um, when the x-ray tech tells you to detent the x-ray tube, they're telling you to put it into the locked position where it's centered to the table or centered to the wall so that we're, you know, pointing at the right thing, okay? The collimator is this box down below. The box has its own controls. The x-ray tube has its own controls. The x-ray tube can roll, can move left and right, can move forward and backward. It has a number of different movements. I'll try to show those here. So a number of different movements along the table, along the length of the table this way, along the width of the table this way, and the x-ray tube on the, on the vertical axis can be raised and lowered. Again, you're going to play with all those things in my laboratory. Um, the x-ray tube can, can be angled in relationship to the table. Okay, we can take and angle the tube. Um, we do that to either elongate or shorten up. You have a hand up? Oh, I didn't see it. Raise your hand. What's your question? Previous slide. Previous slide? I can go to previous slides. No, that's okay. They 
Yeah. No, it's not okay. Did you answer? Did, <laughs> <laughs> did it get answered? It was, it was more of a comment than a question. That's fine. Okay. All right. Do you think everyone should hear it? Yeah. Well, I was, I, I was just going to say that I think that it's pointless for them to have all the, the buttons on top when they have all release. Yeah. You can just move it all around with not having to go transverse. Definitely. I, I, I agree with that for the seasoned X-ray tech. Somebody who's done this for 10 years, you know, I don't agree with it for students, right? The reason I don't is because a student needs to only move one thing. Even somebody who's just done this for a minute, right? Even if you've done this for a long time, you should only really be moving one thing at a time. So yeah, if you haven't had your hands on an x-ray tube, there's buttons up top here. So you can't just move the tube freely, right? It's locked in position until you press a button, right, to release it. Or in my room, there's like knobs that you tighten down. But anyways, it's locked in position, right? So he makes a very good point. There's a button for each individual movement, right? But then there's typically another button up here that, um, I can't see it, but another button up here that it says all release. And it will, when you press it, it releases all of the locks and you can basically just move the tube around anywhere you want to, right? That's good and bad, right? It's good because you have freedom of movement. It can be bad because uh, somebody who is just learning, a student, they're new out in the field, they really only need to be able to adjust one thing at a time. They need to be thinking procedurally through that, right? So well, yeah, once you've done it a lot, yeah, absolutely. The all release is great, so. That's what I was gonna ask you. Do, does every office, so in one of the offices that I work in, you, if, the book, if the machine will, if it wants me to use the wall or uh -huh. the, the bed, mm -hmm. the table, and then if one of the bookies are in, is every office like that? Like if one of the bookies are in on the wall, then it confuses the table? Not necessarily. Sometimes they're completely disconnected. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you have if you have AEC, automatic exposure control, you you have to tell. So I know at SVMC, they probably have AEC, right? They're at the imaging center, big one. They usually have yeah. fancy equipment. Um, and so if you're at a place like that with AEC, specifically automatic exposure control, you have to tell the computer which bucky you're pointing at the yeah. table bucky or the wall bucky because it has to activate remember those little ion chambers i was yeah. showing you it has to activate the right ones okay let's say you have the x-ray tube pointed at the table right x-raying on the table and you think you're using the table bucky but really you've selected the wall bucky okay now the wall bucky's all turned on and ready waiting for exposure but it's never going to get it right yeah you make the exposure to the patient and the thing's just going to expose and expose and expose and expose and eventually it's going to turn off after it's way overexposed to the patient right because the cham the ion chambers on the wall are waiting for exposure and they've never gonna, they're never going to receive it i've made that mistake as a student myself so yeah with aec you've got to tell it which which um which bucky you're pointing at i was just curious because i didn't know like if it's uh, if that's a standard no thing, no or? i mean it's standard for aec but anything else manual exposure control you don't have to tell it which you're pointing at. Now you have to activate the wall bucky or the table bucky. That's a different thing that, that the bucky grid um, actually shakes a little bit during exposure. Yeah. So you have to tell it which one you're activating for a different, totally different reason. But um, most of the time it, the computer doesn't care. You can shoot on either without, without tried, changing anything. I tried to ask like, the text, but I said, they, so what was their comment? Don't, what did they say? <laughs> don't ask me that question. Yeah, I don't, uh, <laughs> Get used to my or don't follow my bad habits or something and i'll sure sure yeah don't follow their bad habits um make your own bad habits right yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. Oh, no. okay, i don't know what our bad habits i'm, I'm learning so what are your bad yeah habits? yeah i'm um, not gonna be hard because you know you learn from one person and you think everything they're doing is like the way it should be done right i mean you learn from me and you think this is the way it should be done maybe right and then you go out there and you learn a completely different way who's right yeah that's i mean like we're floating. kind of all right that's so. why i like floating between like all yeah three absolutely they all have their different ways, and mm -hmm. one doesn't like to shield, the other one does. Like Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, it, it, everyone's a little different. As long as our end product is um, similar, right? The end product yes. radiograph is similar. Yeah. And we've done everything we can to make patient exposures as low as reasonably achievable, right? We adhere to the ALARA principle, right? Mm -hmm. adhere, to, adhere to ALARA principle, and your end result is what is, is the same. I don't care how you yeah. get there. Yeah, yeah. As long as as long as you're safe with the patient and all that stuff, um, the uh, the little nuanced methods method methodological changes are not a big deal to me. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. You're gonna see lots of different things, and that's that's good. It's really good to spend time at different facilities, right? Those of you who spent time at more than one place have seen that, hopefully. It took me forever to learn how to actually move the X-ray tube. <laughs> I was like standing right. there, and I was like. Because I don't want to like mess up anything. Right. So I was trying to move it without. without and you're just like yanking it, yeah, right? And that's worse than not. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, well, I didn't know if I was 
supposed to touch them or what? It was. And, and, and that's what I think the advantage of having the individual control buttons yeah. are, right? Is that you're, each one lets you do only when you press the longitudinal button and you're only moving this way, right? You press the vertical button and you're only moving up and down. You press all release and you're releasing all of them. So I think it's useful to have it all. Um, although some people would prefer to just use the all release. And that's, and that's why it's fine to just use the all release. Then you just like... Sure. Eventually, you kind of just become second nature, right? If, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, it'll become, but if, hands on it enough, and it becomes yeah. second nature. But then, I mean, I have people that just got used to just releasing all the locks, and that's perfectly fine. I, I think I want to add maybe one more consideration when you're thinking about releasing all the locks. Remember, it's a mechanical device, and mechanical devices have a lifetime. There's a there's a finite number of times each lock is going to be able to lock and unlock, right? And if you lock, if you unlock every single lock just to move the tube longitudinally, then you're unlocking every single lock one extra time, right? Now I think one extra time, whatever, right? But again, think about there's a finite number of times, it might be a lot of times, but there's a finite number of times those locks are gonna be able to lock and unlock without failing, right? So it's wear and tear, right? So that's another, maybe another consideration that we don't think about, right? Because it's, we, you know, these tubes are service, you know, usable for you know decades right and we're only using them for a short amount of time so we don't think about the wear and tear but it's one of those things you can, should consider it's kind of the same consideration as we don't rotor excessively right the prep and expose button we don't excessively rotor 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 yeah. waiting for the exposure right we just make the exposure so I'm gonna you're thinking about that too because i've been having a hard time with that like really all, unlocking all of it because sure. the techs do that over there sure. they just unlock all of them sure and, and I was wondering, like, how can, because on top of the thing, you know, it snaps in or Yeah, now, yeah. Detail. And when they unlock it all, it's like it's everywhere. Yes. It's like a machine, and I, I'm going to start doing that now just if they, like, this way. And this One way movement way. at a time, yeah. sure. Yeah. Now, it can be useful to move to move all locks at the same time. If you've got to make, like, a movement from here to somewhere over here, yeah. right, move, move in multiple dimensions at once, it can be useful. That's why it's useful to have all of the, yeah. all of, I'm not advocating that we take away the all release. I'm advocating that we have all of the buttons, no, right? It's, it's kind yeah. of confusing a little bit. Like, I don't know, I guess because I'm learning. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah. So, um, Joshua, comments like that, super useful. You see all of that talk that it just spawned, right? That's why these comments are super useful to us. Not at all. Uh,